everyone. So this episode is a special of all of your questions. As you might have noticed, I answer a listener question each episode. And so this episode is a selection of these questions. I'll answer what I do when I book a medium reading so I know they're not cheating. Have I gotten any signs from my dad? What is it like being friends with psychic mediums? Is it awkward because do they just know all my secrets and everything I'm thinking? And more. And so here's the episode with some of your questions. Welcome to What the Fuck Just Happened. I'm your host, Liz Enton. If you listen to the intro, you know my story. If not, here's a brief summary. I'm a science skeptic, and when my dad died, I took a shot in the dark and decided to investigate if there was any possible evidence of an afterlife. I assumed that was as realistic as Santa Claus, but I was desperate. However, I was so blown away by what I discovered that I wrote a book and launch this podcast. In this podcast, I will be talking to some fairly normal people about some really weird shit. I speak with everyone from psychic mediums and afterlife researchers to ordinary people who've had some inexplicable experiences. So come, listen, there's no need to draw any final conclusions. Keep an open mind and wonder What the fuck just happened? Eric asks, is there anything you would have done differently or any regrets in your research? Um, I don't know if in one sense, I just see a few little things along the way. I wish with the very first medium I went to, I had given a Google voice. I addressed that in the book. That's really the only thing I would say, oh, I should have done that differently. Nevertheless, she did know stuff that could not have been found out by Googling my phone number. And if she had Googled, she wasn't as good as if she Googled, such as getting like my dad's full name and date of passing and all the public record stuff she could have gotten if she just had googled and then i'd say really like for a while i was really considered this a regret and felt bitter um kind of the whole path that i found the people who helped me you know from forever family to the mediums um my main mentor who just was my rock fran ginsburg passed away and I really had sort of periods of like bitterness and regret that this was the path in the sense that I, I did go down this path out of scientific fascination. I do think this is the biggest, most remarkable scientific discoveries. And of course, I also went to heal my grief. So I felt very, in a way, angry and betrayed, like, okay, so I go to heal my grief. I find what I would say are like some of the perfect people to help me. And I end up getting my heart shattered again. And I felt sort of if there is consciousness on the other side that are helping orchestrate this, I felt pretty pissed off as if they'd sort of set me up to just be crushed again. But in terms of how I've handled my research, no, I, d- I don't have regrets. And I guess when it comes down to it, despite my heartache of another loss, I wouldn't do it differently where I never had gotten to meet Fran or never had gotten to meet Forever Family and the close friends I've made through it. So that's, that's the, Danny asks, so you say you still aren't a hundred percent sure there is an afterlife. Is there anything that would make you 100% convinced? Ah. That's a good question. Um, I have thought about this before. And I I don't think there's anything that would 100% convince me. If my dad appeared before me and told me 
that he survived. I was right and told me things I did not know that I then went and verified with my mom. That probably would be the closest to what would convince me. But how could I know that I didn't, in a desperation, hallucinate that somehow had unconsciously remembered my mom had told me this stuff or he had told me this stuff years ago or I overheard them talking and didn't remember it. So my mind fabricated this because I want there to be an afterlife. Um, also, how would I know that I'm not reading my mom's mind, which if I was, that's still pretty amazing and kind of goes against the laws of science as we understand them to be. So it would definitely add to the evidence, but that's probably the closest thing to 100% I could think of that still would not 100% convince me. The other would be if I had a near-death experience. I keep hearing that people come back from them and say they have no doubt afterwards. 99% of people say they have no doubt afterwards this was real, it was realer than real, and there is an afterlife. So I can only assume I'm probably not the exception. I probably would be in the majority that would then end up 100% convinced. But if I could guess if my mind still works the way it does, even with that, I could say, well, how do I not know this was just a grand hallucination? And then I, I guess I kind of try to live my life not 100% convinced about anything, like Right now, the thing that I can most factually say is I am alive and conscious and here now. But again, this gets into philosophy and I like to keep my mind really flexible that I just, how can we 100% know anything? So how do I know, you know, we're not all in a video game simulation that I know some Silicon Valley scientists think, or how do I know that the whole world wasn't just created yesterday and all these memories were implanted in my brain? Or how do I know that I'm not in some matrix hallucination and none of the people around me are real and this is all some hallucination? I mean, I, I think I want to stay the person who is never 100% convinced about anything, but I think as of now, I have drawn a logical conclusion that it is most likely that there is an afterlife. So this week, Brittany asked, are the famous mediums and the mediums that all the celebrities love really that much better than all the others? So I think it really makes no difference in terms of mediums who have celebrity clients and testimonials from them. It really matters what the scientists and researchers say, not so much what celebrities would say. The scientists are really experts in studying psychic medium abilities, and so they know how to test to assure mediums are not cheating or giving cold readings or just giving general information. You know, just because someone is an expert at entertainment or really amazing in the public eye does not necessarily mean they are good at critically assessing psychic mediums. You know, maybe they're super gullible and believe about that kind of thing. But, you know, I don't think it says anything negative about a medium either. Some of the best mediums I've ever seen do have a very public, well-known clientele. But those ones are also certified by Forever Family Foundation or Winbridge and have been studied by scientists at universities. Some of the best I've also seen are very low key. I also did go to one who had a lot of celebrity testimonials, and this was early on in my research, and I was actually curious about testing this exact question. And to be honest, this was one of the worst readings I've ever had. Just so you know, she was not certified by Winbridge or Forever Family Foundation, but she didn't get one bit of evidential information. And she seemed really annoyed and uncomfortable with me that I kept only saying yes or no and not giving, well, actually really just no. I don't think there was any yeses. And she really seemed like she was trying to get me to give her information. 
She finally just asked what I want to even get out of this reading. And I said, valid evidence that we survive bodily death. So then she said, my dad was now telling her to tell me I needed to learn to trust and that I'm way too suspicious. Of course, I would had to tell her that I lost my dad. And I mean, that reading's a whole other story. I'll probably talk about it at some point on this podcast. So back to the question. In terms of mediums also who are famous themselves, I don't know. The few I know who are in the public eye or used to be that I know personally and have watched work or maybe I don't know them, but I had a private reading with them. Those were all ones who were also studied by scientists or certified by Forever Family. They were all amazing and they've been among the best I've seen. But, you know... Some of the ones that are famous themselves apparently aren't. Um, I don't know if you've heard of a skeptic called Susan Gerbic or Jerbic. I'm sorry for pronouncing her name wrong, but it's spelled G-E-R-B-I-C. And she's not a researcher officially. I mean, she thinks all psychic medium abilities are nonsense. But, you know, I'd be so curious for her to go have a reading with one of the ones that have really impressed me and see what would happen. Who knows? But back to her, she did a sting of a famous medium. Again, I'm just going to say not certified by Forever Family Foundation or Wimbridge. But so back to this, she did a sting and she caught him cheating. I won't name him because I'm not going to name and shame, but if you're really interested, you can Google it. So If she had tried those same tactics on the famous mediums that I know, I know it wouldn't work because they're not cheating that way. And so I guess my point is overall, I think fame or being lauded by celebrities is completely irrelevant in terms of mediums capabilities. So Mia asks, why don't evil people, dictators, child abusers, all have NDEs. If there are loved ones on the other side who want the best for us, why don't they make that happen? So evil people grow and stop causing so much harm. Okay, so I get what you're asking. Now, for people not familiar with NDEs, those are near-death experiences where someone is clinically dead and then they're resuscitated and come back reporting experiences such as seeing loved ones on the other side. They are really fascinating and good evidence of survival of consciousness in an afterlife. Dr. Bruce Grayson and Dr. Sam Parnia are some researchers to check out on this topic. You can also listen to my episode with researcher Dr. Jan Holden and an episode I had where I spoke to an NDE experiencer, Jacob Cooper. Overall, during NDEs, these people report coming back transformed, very loving, much more emotionally involved. There was, I forgot the exact story, but there was someone who always wanted to fight people and was like a very angry guy. And he came back just wanting to only help and caring about people. And when people come back, they care a lot less about things like money and power And really more just about love and helping people. So in theory, a dictator with a lot of power, like, say, Putin, who had an NDE, could come back and transform the world. Or an abuser who hurt their family, while they couldn't transform the world to the level Putin could, they certainly could transform the world for their family and loved ones. Or then you take even a meh person with tons of power like Jeff Bezos he could come back and transform workers rights and environmental aspects of shipping and packaging but you know none of those people have had NDEs as far as I know so the only true honest answer I can have is I don't know I've always thought the same thing and that it would be really great if this did happen. I can give some theories. I know that mediums would say that there is a purpose to life 
and maybe that would interfere with this person's growth and who they are supposed to be in this life and all the people's lessons they're supposed to learn who encounter these people. Others might say that earth is supposed to be a challenge and that would take away a lot of the challenges that people are supposed to face who encounter and have to deal with these difficult people. I mean, maybe. I, I can't really have an opinion on that. Um, in terms of research, people have no idea why some people who are declared clinically dead and get resuscitated have NDEs and then others don't. I can't begin to touch upon that at all. So you take it to this question, I, I can't answer it either. I mean, in terms of terrible people having NDEs and why some people do and some don't, maybe some things in this world really are just completely random. Maybe, maybe not. There are just so many ways to look at this from the purely random all the way to that there is some grand plan and role we are all supposed to play for our highest growth to many possibilities or theories in between those two. Yeah, I really wish these people would all have NDEs too. I mean, actually, it would probably be amazing if everyone had one. But then, you know, if there is a plan to all of this, if we were supposed to know and be that, and I'm using air quotes here, enlightened, we would all be able to remember and know the other side and the NDE lessons without having to have that bodily trauma of an NDE where we almost died or were injured. So anyway, I wonder the same thing. I really have no valid answer beyond just theorizing, but really good question. So Olivia asks, what's the difference between a psychic and a medium? I've always thought they were the same thing, but it seems you've mentioned in your podcast, they're actually two different things. Hi, Olivia, that's a good question. I actually used to think they were the same too, but they're not. So there is a quote that I learned by Lloyd Arbach, and it seems to be kind of the general consensus in parapsychological research. All mediums are psychic, but not all psychics are mediums. So what's the difference? The difference is in a medium reading, the medium is communicating with the consciousness of our deceased loved ones. In a psychic reading, the psychic or the psychic medium is reading a living person's energy. That's when if you went to get a reading, a psychic reading about yourself, that's when they would know things such as occurrences that happened in your past, what's going on with your love life, finances, career, health. Those are the type of questions people usually want answered in a psychic reading. In a medium reading, that's when either people want to communicate with someone who's passed away. That's when researchers are studying. Or if you personally want to see for yourself, is it possible that we survive bodily death, that our consciousness survives in some way? And so those are two different types of readings. I will go into more in other episodes about how you can tell which is which, and some of the research done on both. But a really interesting episode where I talk about this is episode 31 with Mark Bacuzzi, one of the co-founders of Winbridge Institute, because they have studied the difference between the two types of readings and how do we know a medium is not just reading us psychically. And I think that's there's a lot of interesting research on that topic, which I'll go into in later episodes. Allison asks, in all your research, when were you the most shocked? Okay, good question. So in the beginning, I was in this constant state of shock. Everything I was reading, every study I read or class I took, when I started seeing mediums give group readings, when I got private readings, it was like this roller coaster of shock and thrill and then terror, like, oh my God, I'm about to find the catch and this is all going to be bullshit. And it was just this very intense emotional experience, probably for about a year and a half, two years. And 
the shock started to go away most of the time. And I definitely miss it, but it's still there. It's just not as constant. I'll be just walking along and suddenly think, holy fuck, there's actually a bunch of evidence that seems to say there most likely is an afterlife. Or I'll be hanging out with one of my medium friends and they'll tell me a story. Or I'll be watching them give group readings and suddenly those chills and shock will hit me again or during one of my own readings. And it'll happen sometimes when I'm reading a study or hearing about some new data or amazing experience. So those little shocks will just come and hit me again, which is really wonderful. And just this overall moments where I'm just like, wait, like, holy fuck, how? There really, there actually seems most likely an afterlife. But it's definitely not those chronic shocks that I had in the beginning when I assumed there was zero chance of an afterlife and I started examining all the evidence. Chloe asks, what do I mean by an unintentional cold reading? She's heard me mention on this podcast that some mediums accidentally give just a cold reading, which is when someone gives a reading off of how someone looks or logical information based on reading their facial expressions, as opposed to an actual psychic or medium reading. And the really good psychics and mediums don't do this overall. But it's when someone is getting information by normal means and they believe that they do have psychic medium abilities and believe that they are getting this information psychically or mediumistically. I'll give an example. So I once took a mediumship class just for fun. I don't have abilities. And I was paired with a woman who was probably about 60. And I was told to give her a psychic medium reading. And things came into my head, such as, you've lost a grandmother. She loved to bake. You were close with her. Those are all very logical things to deduce. And... I know it, that they were just coming into my head logically and I was trying to do the assignment and give information and I'm not a psychic medium and I wasn't able to get information any other way. So now if I believed I had abilities, I might think I'm giving a psychic medium reading. Often when people think they have abilities, it'll be very general information, such as what I just said, that a 60 year old has lost a grandmother. I think, although I'm not positive, I think all psychic mediums might get a tiny percent of information that way. Maybe like 2% of the information. They are humans and they're reading a human and maybe a small percent of the information, some of them would still pick up that way, the way anyone else would, but they also are getting information from someone who's passed away that they really couldn't get off of looking at a person such as someone's job who's passed or a favorite memory. So that's what I mean when I say giving an unintentional cold read. Okay, so this isn't exactly a question about afterlife evidence, but it's a great question. Erin asks, what's the dumbest thing I've ever heard about grief? Oh my god. God, how do I choose one? There's so many. I think overall, it's just anyone or anytime someone thinks they know better than you about how to handle your grief. Even if they've had a loss, that doesn't mean they know what's right for you to do. So I'd say almost anything that starts with you need to or you should, because how would they know what you need to do? And anything that disrespects your grieving process is really just, oh, don't, no, it's not helpful. And some of the classics that we all unfortunately know, they're in a better place, this was meant to be, 
be grateful that at least and just really the best thing to do and the best people to surround yourself with in grief are those that respect your individual process and respect your own individual process. There's no right way. There's no wrong way. Sometimes your way and your best friend's way, if you've both had grief, might be completely different. Your way of handling grief might be completely different than how you thought you would handle it. And maybe you handle it differently this week than you did the week before. So just respect your process. Okay, so this is an interesting question. Going right there, making me think about where I'm at personally. Knowing all the evidence you know, are you still scared to die? Yes and no. Biologically, I think I have all the same instincts I always had, even before I thought there was an afterlife. And they kick in when there's major turbulence on a plane. I feel terrified. If I got a scary test at the doctor's, I'd probably feel really scared if a car comes speeding at me. Every physiological instinct to survive kicks in the same level it always did. I also still have a lot I want to do with my life. I don't feel at all ready to die. I would be very sad to find out I was dying now. However, I really don't feel afraid of dying in a logical, emotional way. You take away the instincts? No, I'm not scared of it at all anymore. I mean, there's a little bit of the fear of the unknown, and I'm not 100% positive without a doubt there's an afterlife, even though I'm pretty much convinced. So I'm the least scared I've ever been. I don't have this existential dread I used to. And instinctively, my body is as programmed as it always has been to want to fight to survive. And long term, knowing that I'm going to die one day doesn't bother me. And it used to bother me. So a lot of people have asked this question. Why do accurate mediums still get some information that's wrong? Okay, so the short answer is, I don't know. The scientists like Dr. Julie Beischel and Dr. Ed Kelly don't know. But there's some thoughts on this. I also talk about it more with mediums in some future episodes, but here's some ideas. First of all, some might just be completely wrong. Mediums are people. No person is 100% right in their career. Even the best of the best get things wrong. Also, maybe the discarnate, your deceased loved one, is thinking or remembering something you don't. How often does this happen with two living people where someone remembers something or perceives a past event a certain way and the other is like, what are you talking about? I don't remember that at all or that's not how it happened. So maybe that's it. Also, sometimes the medium does turn out to be right and you, the sitter, didn't know something. I love when that happens because it's just so evidential. It also helps add evidence that the medium is really communicating with someone who passed away and isn't reading your mind. I've had a few really cool experiences like that. I mention a few in my book, such as when my friend and psychic medium Renee Buck knew something about my uncle that I was convinced was wrong. She kept insisting She was getting this, and she was really confused. And it turned out she was right, which I was so happy about. That was just really interesting. And so another idea, and I've seen this happen with mediums, is that the medium is interpreting based on their own life and worldview and experiences. So I'll give a specific example that really happened to me, and I'm going to just kind of suck it up and give away some evidence here. So I had a medium early on ask if my dad was a firefighter. No, he wasn't. So they asked who in the family was because he kept showing a fire, which they usually associated as someone being a firefighter. And there wasn't 
anyone in my family or anyone I was close with I could think of who's a firefighter. So then they asked if he was hurt in the fire and he wasn't. And I just could have marked fire as wrong. But then I realized he must mean Fire Island. That was a key place to my family and where we spent our summers when I was growing up. It means so much to my dad, too, for so many reasons. So that's what I said. I was like, could he mean Fire Island? And the medium said, oh, my God, yes, that's it. That just feels right now. So that's kind of a balance of what you accept and move forward with. And when you feel you're pushing it and making things fit. And there really isn't a perfect scientific formula of how you do this. I'll I'll go more into that as another question in a future episode of what you accept versus what you reject when the evidence isn't 100% clear. But I hope this gives some insight into the possibility that information isn't necessarily wrong when you think it could be. Although it very well just if you have any questions you want answered in a future episode, email them to me at hello at wtfjusthappened.net. You can also request that I keep them anonymous. To get more information on what the fuck just happened, go to wtfjusthappened.net. There, you can order my book, What the Fuck Just Happened? A Sciency Skeptic Explores Grief, Healing, and Evidence of an Afterlife. And you can learn all about how I came to conclude that there most likely is an afterlife. You can also learn about the early stages of my grief and the amazing, fascinating people I met along the way. You can also read about how much I harassed them, trying to get evidence, see if they were cheating, and see if they were sane. There, you can subscribe to our newsletter. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. It makes such a difference, especially for a new podcast like this one. And if any of you have had a crazy what the fuck yourself, have any questions, feedback, or just want to say hi, reach out on either Instagram at WTF underscore just underscore happened underscore, or email me at hello at WTF just happened dot net. And remember, you don't have to draw any final conclusions as you wonder what the fuck just happened.